Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Jan Dipchansky. Um, I'm the Associate Director of the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, since it's March 8th today, I'd like to start by wishing everyone a uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, this is a, a holiday that um, is, uh, is important and should be important to everyone um, around the world. Um, and um, it, meant to call attention to uh, problems of, of gender equity uh, and the problems of, of um, uh, violence against women uh, and also women's rights. Um, so on behalf of the European Union Center and the Illinois Global Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's event, Holding Putin Accountable for Crimes Against Peace. Uh, this event is part of the EU Center's brown bag on understanding Europe. And it is also uh, part of the Illinois Global Institute's series on global responsibilities, which in 2023 is titled The Global Impacts of the War in Ukraine. Um, for more about uh, these lecture series and to see a list of upcoming speakers, uh, please visit uh, igi.illinois.edu uh, for the Illinois Global Institute or europe.illinois.edu for the European Union Center. So it's really a, a pleasure today to um, welcome to the University of Illinois, uh, our speaker. Francine Hirsch is Villa's Distinguished Achievement Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where she teaches um, Russian and Soviet history, as well as the history of, of human rights and international law. Um, of course, uh, to talk about uh, Professor Hirsch's career, one can't uh, go without mentioning that she is the author of Empire of Nations, Ethnographic Knowledge, and the Making of the Soviet Union, um, which is a, a truly pathbreaking work uh, and contribution to the history of the Soviet Union, um, in which uh, Dr. Hirsch elucidates the role of, of uh, ethnographers and scientific knowledge in creating uh, a multinational uh, state, um, which um, famously uh, is uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and I remember reading this book um, both before and, and in, while I was in graduate school working on a PhD in Russian history. Um, and uh, I have to say it was one of the more uh, influential and important books um, that I can uh, remember reading. Um, since then, um, she has published Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, A New History of the International Military Tribunal After World War II, uh, which came out in 2020, um, and has become uh, an expert and an outspoken commentator um, about the history of international law, the Nuremberg uh, tribunals, um, and the problem of war crimes. Um, since February 2022, um, Dr. Hirsch's writing and commentary about Russia's war against Ukraine war crimes and international law has appeared widely uh, in uh, numerous publications. Um, and you can also find uh, Fran Hirsch on Twitter uh, at the handle at Fran Hirsch. Um, mm -hmm. So she publishes and shares uh, many uh, important uh, uh, items and, and commentary there. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Professor Francine Hirsch uh, and um, welcome. Thank, thank you so much um, for that really lovely introduction. And um, I, I wanted to thank you, Mark Ian, and the European Union Center and the Illinois Global Institute for in inviting me to speak with you all today. Honestly, I'm really grateful for any opportunity um, these days to keep the conversation focused on Ukraine. Um, it's been over a year now since Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, and we've seen mounting evidence of Russian war crimes and crimes against humanity. Evidence of the murder of civilians, the kidnapping of children, the abuse of prisoners of war, and, and really the list, of course, goes on. World leaders, including President Biden, have publicly called out Russia for these crimes, and they've accused Russian leaders of carrying out a genocide of Ukrainians. As the war continues, there's also been a massive effort to interview witnesses and collect documentary proof um, for future trials. The International Criminal Court, the ICC, and dozens of national governments have been working together to, to collect evidence and start to prepare these cases. And of course, Ukraine has also launched its own efforts to prosecute Russian war crimes. 
as of this February, its prosecutor general's office um, had registered more than 70,000 suspected cases, and the number has been rising um, by the hundreds every day. At the same time, many lawyers and world leaders, um, including um, Ukrainian President Zelensky, have argued that these efforts, as important as they are, um, really cannot go far enough that it's not enough to focus on war crimes and crimes against humanity or even the crime of genocide. They've been calling also for the creation of a special tribunal, possibly on the Nuremberg model, to try Russia's leaders for planning and waging an illegal war of aggression, or what at Nuremberg had been called crimes against peace. The idea of creating a Nuremberg-like tribunal has gained traction in recent weeks. In December, a draft proposal began circulating at the United Nations. In January, a number of major newspapers came out publicly in support of such a tribunal as well. And I think it's interesting um, reading these op-eds, also the language that they've been using. Um, the Washington Post, and I'll quote here, noted that it would be naive to think Putin and those in his circle would appear as defendants anytime soon, but that it would also be unconscionable to fail to establish a formal mechanism to hold them personally to account for the crime of waging a war of aggression. And, and of course, in February, just a few weeks ago, the European Union um, has taken important steps, um, very important steps, I think, towards making this tribunal a reality. The European Commission, the executive arm of the EU, announced the creation um, at The Hague of a new international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression. Um, and the center will begin its work by securing key evidence on the crime of aggression with the aim of building a case. Um, it will work with Ukrainian lawyers and with Eurojust, um, the European Union Agency for Criminal Justice Cooperation. This is a critical step toward the future trial of Russia's leaders, a trial that, that I believe will be critical to bring justice to Ukraine, any kind of justice, right? Um, and also to reaffirm the basic principles of international law. So I'm a historian, I'm a historian of the Soviet Union. And as, as Markin mentioned, I, I wrote a couple, a couple of years ago, it was published a book about Nuremberg and the Nuremberg trials. And since the start of the war, I've been focused in part on the history of war crimes and the history of the prosecution of war crimes. And really that's the angle um, from which uh, I'm coming to you with, with my talk today. And in my talk, I wanna address um, three key questions. First of all, what is the crime of aggression or crimes against peace? And here I'll do a bit of a deep dive into the history of war crimes and Nuremberg highlighting actually the role of the Soviet Union in pressing for the criminalization of aggressive war. I'll discuss why that history matters today um, and, and why it's important to know that the Soviets had, had been part of these earlier discussions. Second, um, I'll ask, why do we need a Nuremberg-like tribunal when we have the International Criminal Court, right? We have the ICC. And here I'll get a bit into the nuts and bolts of the ICC as well as its limitations. And third, I'll, I'll ask a question that, that I hear a lot whenever I talk about the question of um, justice or a tribunal or international law when it comes to thinking about the war um, in Ukraine right now, which is why talk about a trial of Putin right now when the war itself is far from over? And here I'll reflect a bit on um, what I see as some important lessons from Nuremberg and on the importance of looking ahead, even at this moment um, when the war is very much still a reality. All right, so to, to begin, um, what is the crime of aggression or what at Nuremberg was called crimes against peace? It wasn't until um, Nuremberg that waging a predatory war was seen as a crime for which leaders could be held individually, criminally accountable. Now the international movement to criminalize wars of conquest actually took off after the First World War. International lawyers and politicians, desperate to preserve the, the, the peace at this point, vigorously debated the legality of war. In 1927, the League of Nations adopted a resolution deeming a war of aggression to be an international crime. In 1928, the United States, France, and 12 other countries signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact, renouncing war as an instrument of national policy. 
And by late 1929, more than 60 states had signed on. Now, the League of Nations Resolution and the kellogg briand Pact were seen at the time as significant achievements, and, and rightly so, they were significant achievements. But some international lawyers criticized them for not going far enough, for failing to make aggressive war a punishable criminal offense. And one of those lawyers was the Soviet Union's Aaron Trainin, a Moscow-based criminologist and international law expert, and the focus of, um, of much of the research that I did for, for the Nuremberg book in terms of trying to understand um, where the Soviets were coming from and the role that they played at the Nuremberg trials. Um, Trianin in lectures and publications um, starting in the mid 1930s called for the creation of an international criminal court to try persons, including leaders, who violated the peace. And that's the terminology that was initially used of who violated the peace. Now, as we all know, this discussion got nowhere at the time. It did nothing to prevent the Second World War. But the horrors of that war and the occupation of Europe brought a renewed conversation about the illegality of war, a conversation in which Trianon, along with other jurists, especially jurists from the occupied countries of Europe, would play a major role. So Trianon. The Soviet Union, um, it took up the question of Nazi criminality in the darkest days of the Second World War, when victory seemed very far away. The Soviets were prompted by the brutality of the Nazi occupation and by the understanding that German atrocities, including the burning of villages and the massacre of civilians, were part of a deliberate German plan. In October 1942, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov publicly called for the convening of a special international tribunal. He invited all other interested governments to cooperate in bringing Hitler, Goering, Hess, and other Nazi leaders to justice. Now, the Soviets were out in front here in their demand for an international tribunal. The United States and Britain, they were not interested in talking about a trial of Nazi leaders while the war was still going on. They were worried about reprisals against allied prisoners of war. And frankly, they couldn't see the point of having that conversation at that moment. And so the Soviets went down their own path. They turned down an invitation from the British to join an allied war crimes commission, what became the United Nations War Crimes Commission or the UNWCC. And they created their own war crimes commission, the Extraordinary State Commission. At the same time, Molotov, turned to Moscow's Institute of Law and asked its lawyers to assess a key question. And I'll read this question out to you because it, I think it's important, this formulation. What was the criminal responsibility of Nazi leaders for invading other countries in pursuit of predatory goals and for the atrocities that were committed as part of that invasion? One of the leaders who took up Molotov's call was Trainin, Aaron Trainin. In the summer of 1943, Trinan presented a report to Molotov called The Criminal Responsibility of the Hitlerites. Trinan argued that the scope of the war was so overwhelming and Nazi crimes against civilians was so shocking that it would be unthinkable not to hold the perpetrators to account. And it was interesting, the resonance between that language and that Washington Post article is, is, um, is really something. He maintained that the German state must face political and economic sanctions for exactions, but he also argued that the that criminal responsibility must be borne by individual perpetrators at all levels. Now, Trainin rejected um, the plea of following superior orders, which was still a very popular defense at the time. He argued that soldiers must face punishment for war crimes. He also argued that the greatest degree of criminal responsibility belonged to Germany's leaders. And he, here he gave a list, which again, I think is quite interesting. He called out Hitler and his ministers, the leadership of the Nazi party, Nazi authorities in the occupied territories, the military high command, and Germany's financial and industrial leaders who had bankrolled Hitler. 
Trianon further argued that Germany's leaders should be tried not only for traditional war crimes, in other words, violations of the laws and customs of war that had been codified in things like, like the Hague Conventions, but also for waging a predatory war in the first place, for committing crimes against peace. Trianon coined the term crimes against peace. His definition included things like acts of aggression, propaganda of aggression, the conclusion of international agreements with aggressive aims, in other words, intent to commit aggression, and terrorism. Trainin also argued that Nazi leaders could and should be tried for participating in a criminal conspiracy. He repeated Molotov's call for a special international tribunal, and he also proposed that crimes against peace should be included in a new international law convention. So a few months later, in October 1943, the Allied War Crimes Commission organized by the British, the UNWCC, it met in London. And the Soviet Union was the only Allied power that was not at the table. And the UNWCC's members immediately became embroiled in a debate about how to define war crimes. The head of the commission, the British judge, Sir Cecil Hurst, he wanted to define war crimes as violations of the laws and customs of war, in other words, like in keeping with the Hague Convention. But representatives from a number of countries of occupied Europe, including the Belgian delegate, uh, Marcel de Baer, and the Czech delegate, Bohuslav Etcher, um, they fought for a much broader definition. They argued that the commission must extend its reach to acts that would not typically be considered war crimes, such as Germany's persecution and murder of its Jews. And they also argued that the UNWCC must also expand the definition of war crimes to include the crime of war. And they continued, and the, the way that they made this argument, again, I think is very interesting. They argued that without aggressive war, there would be no war crimes and that it was illogical to punish the products of the crime and not the crime itself. Soviet leaders and lawyers, of course, um, shared this view, right? That's what they have been arguing for now for, for quite some time. In July, 1944, um, Soviet leaders turned Trianon's report on the criminal responsibility of the Hitlerites into a book with the same name. And the timing here was critical. The Red Army was now on the move. That summer, it launched its most um, ambitious offensive, retaking Belarus and marching westward through Poland. As Soviet leaders looked with hope to the end of the war, they again pressed their case for a special international tribunal. Trainin's book soon made its way across Europe and then to London, where it was translated into English and discussed by the members of the UNWCC in a number of their sessions. And some UNWCC members like Etcher embraced it. At a meeting in October 1944, Etcher argued that defining the current war as criminal made it possible to see acts like the extermination of foreign races, not as simple violations of the laws and customs of war, but as instruments of a general criminal policy. Using Trianon's term, he argued that the preparation and launching of the present war must be punished as a crime against peace. From London, Trianon's book traveled to the United States. It landed at the War Department Special Projects Branch and then at the White House. In January 1945, a couple of lawyers with the Special Projects Branch, Murray Bernays and D.W. Brown, they wrote a secret report for President Franklin Roosevelt on this question of whether starting the current war was a crime for which Nazi leaders could be tried and punished. They answered yes, even as they acknowledged that this opinion broke from current US policy. And, and again, what, what they said in their, in their memo, I think is also very interesting. They maintain that international law evolves with the public conscience and that it can no longer be disputed that the launching of a war of aggression today is condemned by the vast majority of mankind as a crime. They pointed out that this view was shared by a number of allied lawyers, including the British lawyer, Hirsch Lauterpacht, and the Soviet lawyer, Aaron Trainin. As the allied victory began to seem certain, American and British leaders came to embrace the idea of bringing Nazi leaders before an international tribunal. 
After the Nazi surrender in May 1945, plans to be organized the International Military Tribunal, right, what were soon called the Nuremberg Trials, um, those plans began in earnest. Representatives from the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, including Trianon, met in London that summer to discuss the tribunal's framework. And much of the discussion focused on the charges. It was agreed that the defendants would be tried with traditional war crimes, violations of the rules and customs of war, in addition to crimes against humanity, um, defined as inhumane acts against civilians, including atrocities and, and the persecution of groups for racial, religious, and other reasons, right? And crimes against peace. Crimes against peace turned out to be a, if not the central charge at Nuremberg, really the crux of the case. The judgment ultimately declared aggressive war to be the supreme international crime, containing within it the accumulated evil of the whole. Nuremberg established that the leaders of a state could be held criminally responsible, individually criminally responsible for waging a war of aggression, that leaders did not have immunity from prosecution. Nuremberg served as a precedent for further post-war trials and ideas about justice and human rights that were expressed at the Nuremberg trials fed, in, fed into a broader discussion then about the role that international institutions could play in preserving the peace and preventing atrocities. In short, Nuremberg sparked a revolution in international law. And I think that it's important to remember that the Soviet Union had been an important part of this revolution. It's important to, to kind of keep emphasizing that Putin has breached an international legal system that is not a Western system, that is an international legal system that the Soviet Union and its Moscow-based lawyers helped to create. That the Soviet Union after the Second World War had insisted successfully on trying Germany's leaders for some of the very same crimes that Russia's leaders are committing in Ukraine today. This revolution in international law, what has been talked about as the Nuremberg moment, was a time actually of great optimism about the progressive development of international law. That was the term that was used to better serve humanity. At the same time, the Nuremberg model of justice was, was far from perfect, right? We all know that. After the trials, the French judge, Henri Danu Devab, revealed that he had been troubled at Nuremberg by allegations of victor's justice, by the concern that a court of the victors perhaps could never truly be fully impartial. He and others argued passionately after Nuremberg for the creation of a permanent international criminal court, which would eliminate the need for ad hoc trials like the IMT in the future. And this is where some of the initial impetus for the ICC, the International Criminal Court, came from. Two months after the Nuremberg Judgment, in December 1946, the United Nations Codification Commission began work on a new international law code, a code that would include the new international law principles articulated at Nuremberg, what were being talked about at the time and still to this day as the Nuremberg Principles. It also discussed the creation of a permanent international criminal court. Now, these efforts, of course, ran aground during the Cold War. One sticking point was the definition of aggression, the difference between a just war and an unjust war, the difference between a war of liberation and a war of conquest, right? These, these were questions that took up many, many hours of discussion and debate. And, and, and were not um, resolved satisfactorily, right? Um, but the real issue, the, the issue at the heart of it all was mistrust and concerns about state sovereignty. The IMT had worked um, in part because it only investigated European access crimes. A permanent international court would and still does require all member states and their leaders to cede at least some degree of sovereignty to an international institution. And for a number of states, including the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, and they were not the only ones, right? This was a non-starter. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the United Nations revisited the idea of an international criminal court with ultimate success. In 1998, 120 states adopted the Rome Statute, creating the International Criminal Court, the ICC. 
And in 2002, the ICC began meeting in The Hague. And this, of course, brings us to the second question. Why do we need a Nuremberg-like tribunal to try Putin and other Russian leaders for aggression when we have the ICC? And when the ICC has already put tremendous resources, tremendous resources, into investigating Russian war crimes in Ukraine and preparing for war crimes trials. Now, to answer this, um, we need to talk a little bit about the ICC's jurisdiction, what the ICC can and cannot do. So the ICC has the power to investigate crimes committed on the territory of ICC member states, crimes committed by the nationals of ICC member states, and crimes referred to it by the United Nations Security Council. Now, the third point, of course, is critical because Russia, Ukraine, the United States, and, and, and other um, and dozens of other United Nations member states, 70 states in all, have not joined the ICC. They're not ICC members. So in theory, the United Nations Security Council could refer a case against Russia to the ICC, but we all know that this will never happen um, since Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council and has a veto, right? There would have to be some kind of a workaround. That said, um, the ICC is still, as we know, can do things. Um, it can investigate some crimes committed in Ukraine. Um, and this is in part because in 2014, Ukraine, um, which is not a member state, right, invited the ICC to investigate war crimes committed on its territory. And as a result, the ICC can investigate war crimes committed in Ukraine by all parties to the conflict. And this is indeed what the ICC has currently been doing. But there is a critical crime that the ICC cannot investigate in Ukraine. Of course, this is the crime of aggression. In 1998, the Rome Statute gave the ICC the authority to investigate war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The Rome Statute included aggression as a fourth possible category, but once again, no one could agree on a definition. And once again, the deeper issue um, was concern um, about state sovereignty shared by a number of states. States didn't want to risk the possibility of their own leaders being put on trial. And so the ICC's power to investigate the crime of aggression was put on hold. Now in 2010, an agreement on aggression was finally reached. An addendum to the Rome Statute, the Kampala Amendments, defined the crime of aggression at last. Um, it defined it as the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution of an act of aggression, which by its character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the United Nations Charter. It then defined an act of aggression as the use of armed force by one state to attack the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state with or without a declaration of war. And examples could include invasion, bombardment, occupation, and annexation. The Kampala Amendments further defined aggression as a leadership crime. And Putin's actions against Ukraine, I clearly check off all the boxes here and would clearly fit the bill. But the ICC still lacks power here because compromises had been made to get the Kampala amendments through. And the ICC's jurisdiction over aggression was significantly restricted. All ICC member states can opt out of ICC jurisdiction for aggress aggression crimes. And most have chosen to do so, or many have chosen to do so at least. Plus the leaders and citizens of non-ICC states are fully exempt from prosecution for aggression. This means that the ICC um, can investigate Russian war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine, but it cannot investigate Russia's leaders for aggression. And this is why there's been talk of creating a Nuremberg-like special tribunal to come in where the ICC lacks power, to come in where the ICC lacks jurisdiction. Now, over the past year, um, a number of models have been put forward for a Nuremberg-like tribunal to try Russia's leaders for aggression. One possibility um, is a special international tribunal established by a treaty among interested states. Another is a special Ukrainian court to prosecute aggression that would work in close collaboration with other European states, and that would include both Ukrainian and other European judges. And still another, is for a special tribunal um, in which the European Union takes the lead 
And this is the, the, the one that passed that the possibility that currently um, looks like it might be the most likely. Now, establishing a special international tribunal or any kind of special tribunal to try aggression would obviously take a great deal of effort. And a number of international lawyers um, have continued to challenge the efficacy or usefulness of such a move, um, arguing that, that trying these other crimes like, should be enough. But I think prosecuting aggression is extremely important. Aggression is the foundational crime for reasons that Trainin, Etcher, Deber, and others well understood during the Second World War. Holding Russian leaders and officers accountable for aggression makes it possible to see the murders, deportations, kidnappings, and other horrific crimes being carried out by Russian forces in Ukraine, not as simple violations of the laws and customs of war to you know, go back and quote people like Trainin and Etcher, but as instruments of a general criminal policy. It makes it possible to see these atrocities not as isolated incidents, but as part of an all out assault on the Ukrainian people. The war of aggression planned and waged by Russia's leaders has made possible all the other crimes that have followed. So this brings me to my third question. Um, why have this conversation now? We all understand that Ukraine will have to win the war or that something will need to change dramatically in Russia before Putin and those in his circle can be tried for aggression. Now, in theory, of course, Putin could be tried in absentia. At Nuremberg, uh, Martin Bormann's Hitler's personal secretary was tried in absentia, but it's not fully clear what this would accomplish, I think. Um, but nonetheless, I still think that a history of Nuremberg suggests why it's important to plan for justice now in the middle of the war, even when the outcome is uncertain. And I think that we can actually learn a lot here from, from the Soviet example um, in World War II and by Soviet insistence on calling for and planning for a special international tribunal um, like really in the darkest days of that war. And so there, there are a number of, of um, points that I just wanna make here. So first of all, planning for a Nuremberg-like tribunal now is critical to make sure that the world fully understands that Russia's action that the war itself, that this, it's illegal. The war is illegal. And I think this is a critical starting point for any kind of negotiations um, that might take place at a time in the future and any kind of post-war settlement. It's also important for shaping the international conversation about the war right now. During the Second World War, leaders like Trinin and Etcher made a case for the criminality of Germany's leaders and paved the way for the processes of post-war justice that followed later. They, together with the Allied governments, helped establish the illegality of aggressive war. We must keep the illegality of Putin's war at the front of our minds and remind journalists and politicians of this important fact whenever it's suggested that Ukraine make concessions or give up territory in the name of peace. Putin is a war criminal and his actions should not be rewarded. Okay, point number two, we must move forward with the systematic collection, verification, and registration of evidence of Putin's crimes, of all Russian crimes, including crimes against peace, while that evidence is still fresh. This evidence includes documents, visual evidence, and witness territory. It must be collected now and collected systematically as the European Commission recognizes with its recent actions, right? This is a good thing. It must be collected and systematically if we want to have a justice process later. It's also necessary for posterity, for the creation of a, hist of a historical record. During the Second World War, the UNWCC, the Extraordinary State Commission, and other investigatory commissions did this important work. But let me just say that Nuremberg would have benefited significantly uh, from a unified conversation with one set of standards for the collection and verification of evidence. And we can take a lesson for one of these things that Nuremberg struggled with by thinking about how to do this right today. Third, the creation of a Nuremberg-like tribunal that can try Russia's leaders has actual as well as symbolic importance for the Ukrainian people right now. It affirms the international commitment to Ukraine and it creates momentum for a justice process that might later pave the way for reparations. 
The promise of justice and reparations was critically important to occupied countries during the Second World War. It gave people hope. When Ukrainians today call for a Nuremberg-like tribunal, they are looking back to that moment and also ahead to a moment when it will be possible to build a new future. Fourth. And, and final in terms of these, right? We need to plan for a tribunal to hold Putin accountable for waging a war of aggression in order to affirm that the rule of law and our international institutions still matter. Putin has been acting with impunity. Part of his strategy is to challenge and delegitimize international law, to undercut the international institutions that were established after the Second World War, that were established in part as a result of Nuremberg. So I just wanna conclude um, by bringing us back to the 1945 memo that the two War Department lawyers, Bernays and Brown, sent to President Roosevelt, where they wrote that international law evolves with the public conscience. And so where are we today with regard to international law? Where is our public conscience at? For war crimes to be punished, for our international legal system to work, states must be willing to get behind international principles, to join international institutions and to pursue enforcement. States, even large and powerful ones, must be willing to cede some degree of sovereignty. If we don't want ad hoc tribunals in the future, we'll need a permanent international criminal court with a much broader mandate. We'll need a rethinking of our international institutions and maybe even a new conversation about the progressive development of international law. We'll need, um, dare I say, um, a new Nuremberg moment.